eternal God, your Son, Jesus Christ, is the true bread from heaven. Draw us to Christ that we may receive nourishing grapes for our journey in this world and know at last the joy of everlasting life with Christ, who dwells with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.
us confess our sins to the one who hears our voice and is deeply moved by our distress. Merciful God, we confess that we have not lived as your faithful children. We have not been angry with the world and nursed grudges against our adversaries. We have hoarded the fruits of our labors rather than share our bounty with the needy. We have not built up our neighbors with words of kindness, but have indulged in evil gossip. We have not forgotten the wrongs others have done, even though we deserve your forgiveness for us in Jesus Christ. Heal us, O oh God, and give us the grace to love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Amen. People of God, hope in the Lord. God in Christ has forgiven you. God has redeemed us from all our inequities through Christ, who have loved us and gave himself for us as living bread for the life of the world. Praise be to God. Our responsive psalm reading this morning is from Psalm 130, 
That can be found on pages 518 and 519 of your Pew Bible, or on the screens behind me. In just a moment, I will begin with the odd verses, and you, the congregation, may respond with the even verses. But before we read together God's word, let us first pray for God's wisdom. God of daybreak, our souls wait for your light, more than those who watch for the morning. Let your Holy Spirit illumine our hearts with the light of your redemption, a new day, a new life in Christ. Amen. Now let us read together from God's word in Psalm 130. I begin in verse 1. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your fingers be on me. The voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? So with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I have hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel. Our reading from the New Testament is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 25, through chapter 5, verse 2. Listen again for God's word. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of God. Even though the official end of summer is over a month away, and even though the unofficial end, that is Labor Day weekend, is still three weeks away, we have arrived again at the end of another summer. We can mark this by many things that are beginning and ending. Over is the time in our church for no committee meetings. The committees that have taken a month or more off uh, are meeting again. Changes in programming for the fall are in the works and planning. And stewardship, yep, that fun thing, the thing we like almost as much as evangelism, is right around the corner. It's hard to believe that 2018 is almost two-thirds of the way in the books. Outside of the church, though, there are signs as well. Teachers and students in Taylorville will be returning to class this week. Some of our college students have already headed off to begin the next stage of their life's journey. Sports Illustrated has just this past week delivered on their annual college football preview issue, and the NFL just a few days ago kicked everything off with the first preseason games of this season. As is customary, over the coming four to six weeks, many things will change. And one of those things are the games and the fun that children have out of doors. Children playing in parks or backyards will get more and more infrequent, assuming that is that children still play outdoors. Now, when I was younger, and by younger I mean really young, like kindergartenish young, I can remember long days that never seemed to end, and playing outside during pretty much all of those days. And even in the neighborhood I grew up in, it was not uncommon at that time to play a couple of games. One was follow the leader. The other was Simon Says. They're basically two versions of the same thing. Somebody does something or says something, and 
everyone else is to repeat, to emulate what they are doing. It helps to function, or it functions to help reinforce the skill of listening. And Simon says you have to listen. Does Simon say, or does he not? As well as watching. Okay, see what I did? Watch and do this. Following is an interesting thing. Following someone is an interesting phrase. In recent years, the verb to follow has taken on a whole new dimension. Once, to say that you were following someone literally meant you were trailing behind them and following after them. Maybe like a younger sibling emulating an older one. Or maybe even in a scary or kind of slightly creepy way, like why is that person following me? Yet today, these are often not the first thoughts we have when we hear someone say that they are following us or they ask us to follow them. Invitations to follow are everywhere, especially if you have one of these. One of these. Mine's on silent, by the way. How often do you see or receive the invitation to follow us on Facebook? Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, LinkedIn, um, Pinterest, YouTube, um, or whatever is going to come next. How many people do you follow? What are the things you like and follow on social media? How many follow you and what you do and what you say? Now, if all the people and all of the things you like and follow were, say, up on these screens for all of us to see, what what would we maybe think of that? What am I saying? People rarely hide their true selves on social media. In fact, things they would never think of saying in real life, they will give full vent to that, especially in the last couple of years. Social media can be used for many good, useful, edifying purposes, but also some of the most hateful, degrading, slanderous, false, misleading, bigoted, ridiculous things are posted by us. The dark side of humanity is given full vent for many of us with our online presence and the online presence of others. Maybe we've realized things about people we maybe wish we didn't quite know. It influences us, these things that are said and shared and liked in ways we cannot even begin to fathom or imagine. And if you think the posts or the shares or the likes are bad, read some of the comments that go with some of these. They can be and often are ugly. Who wants to follow ugly? Oh wait, we do. What does Paul have to say about that? After all, social media was not even close to anyone's mind 2,000 years ago, but Surprisingly, in Ephesians 4, Paul has quite a bit to say. He's entering the home stretch of his argument in this letter. His emphasis throughout the letter has been on grace, on maintaining a unity in faith, of recognizing and thanking God for the blessings that God has given us. And now Paul is hitting the practical parts of how do we put that into action. But we really can't get to the point of our reading today without returning to what we actually skipped over, verses 17 to 24. Last week's reading took us up to Ephesians 4, 16, but before we can go on with verse 25, to help us understand it a little bit better, we need to hear the paragraph that comes before it. So I will now begin reading in verse 17. Now, this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you heard, heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, so put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The 
old self, the new self. Taking off the old self, putting on the new self, as if it were a pair of clothes. In faith in Christ, there is the former life, the life that we led, the people we were. Then something happens. Jesus happens into our life. And when that happens, we are not left as we were found. We are different from then on forward. Paul uses here literally what was done in ancient baptism. In the early church, baptism was not a two or three minute part of the worship service. Baptism took literally all night long. And even to be able to be baptized took anywhere from one to two years of preparation before that night. Now, the night where this typically happened was the Easter Vigil. That is the night that ends with the first rays of Easter sunrise. As this service would come to a close, that long night, men and women would be separated into separate rooms and led into a waterway, maybe similar to this. As they would walk into it, they were directed to take off their clothes. The clothes they wore were symbolic of the old life they were about to leave behind, being shed almost like a snake sheds its skin. These newcomers of faith would then enter into this dark tunnel, symbolic of death, sin. But they would emerge after a few steps into those first rays of Easter morning, reborn into the fresh light and life of the risen Christ and were given a brand new set of clothes, bright, white, dazzling clothes. I wonder how many baptisms or how eager we might be for baptisms if we still did it that way. But it made the point, you are no longer who you were when you entered into these waters. That person is gone. God, in the person of Christ, through the power of the Spirit, has changed things, literally changed us. And because of that, we cannot live as we once did. If you ever noticed with the Ten Commandments that there are two ways to read them. Now, I'm not speaking of the version in Exodus 20 and the version in Deuteronomy 5, but rather how we understand those words, what those words are telling us to do. Now, taken on the surface, most of them tell us what not to do. Keeping the Sabbath and honoring our parents, those are exceptions. That's one way to read it. Don't do these things. But if we're not doing those things, then the other way we can read them, even the positive way we can read them, is there are things then that we are supposed to do. If we are not to kill, then we seek to protect and nurture life wherever we find it. If we are not to lie, We are to tell the truth in every word that comes from our mouths. If we are to have no other God but God and worship that God, we worship that God alone. When we walk in newness of life, that is how we are to live. Not as we were, but as the ones we are being led to be in Christ. And surprise, we get there by following. Now, many years ago, with a haunting piano accompaniment, John Lennon asked the world to imagine a different world. Now, even if you didn't then or don't now agree with all of the points he made in the song Imagined, it's pretty hard to deny how powerful that song is and the power of imagination that he sings about. We cannot be a better world if we can't imagine what that might look like if we can't put it into words, if we can't put it into thoughts that we can then put into action. Paul, in a very similar way, pens his own imagination with the words that we find in our passage. Imagine a world, imagine a faith, imagine a community where anger does not rule. I mentioned the idea of ugly in terms of behavior, thought, and communication. A popular saying from a few years ago, God don't like ugly. Anger is what makes us ugly. Not the presence of it. That's a given. It's going to come. But what we do because of that anger. In fact, Paul even goes so far as to say that the enemy, that is the devil or Satan, does not cause anger. We'd like to wish it were so. But it actually comes from us, who we are. But when we nurse it, when we hold on to it, when we nurse those grudges, it's amazing what the enemy can do with that. That is where evil is. Hashtag imagine no anger. 
By the way, if you don't know what a hashtag is, ask your children or grandchildren. They would probably be glad to explain it. Or imagine a world in which thieves give up thievery. And instead of taking things that do not belong to them, they produce all of these things and give them freely to a world in need, like Robin Hood on steroids. Imag hashtag imagine no need. Imagine a group of people who speak so well, every word that comes out of their mouth is just dripping with positivity. Not a single word of hatred, abuse, slander, negativity, or gossip. It never passes their lips. Everything that they say builds bridges rather than tear them down. Everything that they do builds community up rather than obliterates it. Every person that is spoken to is left better for what is said rather than questioning their <clears throat> very own worth. Hashtag imagine love speech. Imagine a table where we are all invited, where all negativity is put away, taken off like yesterday's dirty laundry, where everything that is said around that table and all that is done is kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving. Hashtag imagine all are welcome. It's so funny, we don't think twice about asking if we can follow someone or we can be their friend on social media. But we can't ask them to come to church to try to imagine a life like these. And by the way, none of these hashtags are copyrighted or anything. I literally came up with them not too long ago. But imagine a church that would dare to post those things on their feed and just leave them there. Maybe somebody says, why did you post that? What does that mean? What does that mean to you? What does that look like to you? What would your life be like if you had that? Go ahead. Post them. I double dog dare you. Not even a thing anymore. John Lennon had a good start. And yes, John is far and away my favorite Beatle. It does begin with imagination, with all of us imagining what this world, through our faith in Christ, what that can look like. But do you ever wonder why so often it just ends there? Why that song is so sad when you hear it? It's not the piano. It's the unrealized potential that that song has sung about for the better part of 50 years. Imagination is just not enough. Sorry, John. Forget imagination. What Paul calls us to, actually in our language, also begins with the letter I. What God calls us to is imitation. Now, many of us likely know what that machine on the left is. When I got in trouble in school and was sent out of the classroom to do work by myself, I went to a particular room in that school next to this really smelly machine that printed off these papers with this purplish hue on it. It's a mimeograph machine. This is what passed for a copy machine years and years and years ago. Mimeograph, mimicking. Mimicry. It comes from the Greek word mimeomai, which means to imitate, to use something as a model. Just as a mimeograph takes that master copy and reproduces again and again and again exact purplish copies of itself, we too use our model. We too have a master copy that we are to follow, which is another meaning of the word mimeomai to follow. A master is replicated, duplicated. That is the model that we are to emulate, to follow. We're to follow the leader. We are to listen for when Simon, in this case Christ, says, also for all of the times we think Simon says, but Simon really doesn't, there are plenty of times when God is silent. We need to be careful not to fill in the blanks. What do we do with this imagination we get from God? 
here to take it from imagination and put it into action. To be copies, to be those who do what our Lord and Savior has already done before us. Now, some things in life are not easy. Some of them are deceptively simple. Mimicking, imitating God, that is both. What we are to do, to follow, to emulate, to embody, that is not hard to grasp. Paul gives it to us right there. What we're supposed to do, that's easy. The doing it, that's the hard part. The putting it into action, especially knowing no matter how well we put that into action, we will not get it perfect. But we don't stop trying. We don't stop imagining. We don't stop trying to model our lives on that of the master. That's the first step. We begin with imagination, but we dare not leave it there. After all, the world needs more than just thoughts and prayers from us. It needs us to be and to live as those thoughts and prayers in and for this world. To be the little Christs that we are called to be. The word Christian, that is literally what it translates. Little Christs. Duplicates, little mimeographs of Jesus running around, doing good, spreading God's love. And who wouldn't want to follow that? Amen? Amen. Amen. As we respond to God's word, we do so in song. I invite you all to stand as we sing, O Master, let me walk with thee. Number 738, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3. be seated. As we come to our time of prayer, a few needs and concerns to be aware of. We certainly pray for the children of our community, the teachers in our midst and community that will be returning to school. We pray for a safe, uh, a fun, and a very productive year of education that is about to begin. Uh, we pray for those in our midst that are ill or are healing. We pray for Shirley Wheeler, a member living in Iowa who has recently entered hospice care. We pray for her and her family during uh, these difficult days. We continue to lift up Mary Masick, uh, who had a hip surgery earlier this week and is recovering. Um, we know she's had a very slow recovery. We 
pray for God's healing touch to be with her. We also pray for Larry Bruns, who has had a return of his lupus uh, and is in a good deal of pain today. We pray for comfort and relief for him. Are there other needs and concerns we would lift before God and one another, or even joys and blessings we would share and thank God for? Bill. One blessing that we should share and be thankful for is the musical ability of the people who perform the special music. Absolutely. We have indeed been blessed all this summer long with gifts of instrument, gifts of voice, uh, gifts of voices linked together in beautiful music. We thank uh, Keith and Angie especially, and uh, Sally over at the organ bench, uh, and all who have participated and shared their God-given gifts with us. Jim has had uh, such a difficult road these past uh, few years, um, but a great blessing there um, that even though the child was born early, uh, she is a fighter. Seeing and hearing no others, let us carry this as well as all that remains on our hearts and minds as we turn again to God in prayer and as as I pray, merciful God, we will all pray together, hear our prayer. Sisters and brothers, confident in God's love in Jesus Christ, let us pray for the world and for our needs, saying, merciful God, hear our prayer. God, you have called forth the church to embody your way of life. Help those, even us, who profess faith in Christ to be your faithful disciples, to live according to your word. For all who follow Jesus Christ, merciful God. God, your children imitate you by speaking truth, showing forgiveness, and dwelling together in loving community. For our neighbors and our neighborhoods, that we may live in peace and in justice. Merciful God. Lord, our civic leaders face daily challenges and even temptations. For all government officials, near and far, that they may have integrity of heart and wisdom of judgment as they seek to live out your call in their performance of public service. Merciful God. God, people of earth hunger for the spiritual food you provide, that which gives meaning to life. So many also hunger for good bread and safe drinking water, even for the bare necessities of life. For those who struggle against the forces and power of poverty, and for those who pursue justice in the sharing of Earth's resources. Merciful God. God, your world is filled with the lights of natural beauty, but also with the danger of natural disaster. For the planet Earth, our home, that people may dwell in peace in the land, honoring its beauty, conserving its resources, and respecting its power. Merciful God. Amen. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people gathered together and grant that which we ask in faith, that we may receive according to your gracious and abundant love through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we now pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. standing for our sending hymn number 319 men of faith rise up or shout to the north 
We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3 with the chorus, but remain on the first page. by the Father, nourished by Christ, and sealed by the Holy Spirit, go now to imitate God's amazing love, feeding the hungry, forgiving the hateful, and spreading the fragrance of grace wherever there is need. God feeds us forever with the bread of life and upholds us with steadfast love. You are blessed, redeemed, and gifted with grace through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.